Uh, good evening. On behalf of uh, CSDS, let me take the opportunity to welcome you all for this last uh, CSDS Voltage Jubilee Lecture Series. Uh, the series of uh, CSDS Voltage Jubilee Lectures began in December 200, uh, 2012. Uh, before today's lecture, we had about 22 lectures, uh, very exciting lectures by eminent scholars. And today is the 23rd lecture in the series. And I'm delighted to welcome Professor Megan Morris who would be today speaking on the topic of praise of parochial black blockbuster, community change and glitch in translocal action cinema. Uh, so welcome Professor Megan Morris. Uh, let me extend my thanks to Professor Ravi Vasudevan who has been to chair this lecture. So over to Ravi. Well, it's a, a great honor to uh, welcome Megan Morris uh, to CSDS. Um, she's been an absolutely inspirational figure uh, in terms of many, many uh, frontiers and horizons uh, over the last 25 to 30 years. A uh, key figure, uh, perhaps a crucial figure in post-colonial studies and theory. A feminist who works in that field with a self-consciousness about the actual problem, problematic relations often between these kind of sectors of experience. Uh, and someone who is... Uh, uh, works with an interdisciplinary kind of rigor. It's uh, unusual to see this combination of wit and humor not being interlaced with this kind of rigorous kind of deployment of categories. And that's one of the pleasures which one actually gets from reading uh, Megan Morris, uh, including the kind of moments of uh, unselfconscious frustration when uh, her carefully modulated theoretical formulation seems to be coming asunder. Uh, as when in 1981 she goes to the Sydney telecommunication tower, rigorously maps it, notes all the kind of failures of its post-colonial kind of lack of vision, uh, its replenishing of a white imaginary, goes 10 years later and finds none of it available. <laughs> and it's completely frustrated. Now what do I do with this? Huh? So this particular way in which history itself becomes an interesting object of a person who is self-professedly not a historian, but works with history and with context very powerfully. And actually, I think I would repay historians a great deal to look at the way in which he mobilizes context. Uh, not in some, some ways a professional historian does to actually kind of locate a moment in time, but to braid it with a certain way in which we can engage it and the shifting ways in which objects and the methods which constitute them could actually be uh, excavated. There's a really interesting way in which context itself becomes very critical here. Uh, popular genre uh, is something which uh, Megan has used with great kind of uh, activity. And of course, uh, one of the most recent ventures in this direction uh, arises from her work at, in Hong Kong at uh, Ling Man University, where she uh, co-edited a book on the uh, transnational action film situated in Hong Kong, but with a number of other local variations and contributions to the field, including work from India. Uh, let me get back to a more formal conclusion to this uh, introduction, which is to formally introduce uh, Professor Megan Morris, Professor of Gender and Cultural Studies, Distinguished Adjunct Professor of Cultural Studies at Ling Nan University, Hong Kong, Fellow of the Academy of Humanities of Australia. Key texts include Identity Anecdotes, Translation and Media Culture from 2006, too Soon, Too Late, History and Popular Culture from 1998, uh, and in 1988, The Pirate's Fiancé, Feminism, Reading, and Postmodernism. Today, Professor Morris is going to talk to us about In Praise of Parochial Blockbusters, Community, Change, and Cliché in Translocal Action Cinema. Welcome, Professor Morris. I'm honored and thrilled to be here, uh, not least to be taking part in your Golden Jubilee. I feel like pinching myself a little that I'm actually in Delhi and speaking to people who have read things I've written. Uh, living in Hong Kong for and working there for 13 years, I became very used to having extraordinarily productive collegial relationships but I'm sure nobody I have ever worked with amongst my Chinese colleagues read a word um, that I've, I've written and I have come to live this kind of norm. 
So I'm overwhelmed by your, your hospitality and the kindness of my welcome here. Uh, there are very many people I need to thank, but most immediately, Ravi and uh, Praveen, who've helped me so much with practical details of getting going. Um, but today, I, I need to begin with uh, an acknowledgement and also an image which is a gift for Kumar Shani, whom, to whom <laughs> I made a promise perhaps 20 years ago now, maybe not quite that long, but getting there, when Kumar very nobly sat through a whole lecture of mine with many, many clips on a... American karate B star, Cynthia Rothrock, and afterwards came up and asked me to promise that when I had exhausted everything I had to say about very, very bad films, <laughs> I would return to what is actually my roots in criticism and write a book on the avant-garde. <laughs> I've taken this as a wonderful challenge, and of course, 20 years later, I have still not exhausted my passion for <clears throat> action films and B films. But I am going to keep my promise, and I'm getting there. And although it probably won't be obvious, my theme today is part of beginning to think again about the relationship of the avant-garde historically and in the present to what we might call very, very mainstream cinema. And the link is the thinking I've been doing about cliché. The image you see on the screen, a very famous moment from Bunuel's uh, 1924, I think, film, uh, Un Chien Nul, I don't think you'd ever call it a cliché. It's rather what Bart meant by a myth. It signifies today avant-gardeness of a certain kind. This is the moment just before a razor goes through what is famously a sheep's eye in the next shot. And it's an image rich with the history of interpretations of it, uh, not least, most obviously, the hit A particular history of the avant-garde as one in which um, a forceful male vision acts upon the female spectator. The female spectator in the 1920s was a, a very troubled figure in Europe and a very important one. And the male tie in this image um, tells you really all, all you need to know about the, this particular gender construction, but I'm less interested in that uh, now than in what becomes of what I will call in my private mythology the razor moment, which is what the traditional avant-garde um, aspired to bring to all spectators, whether a woman was the figure of this spectatorship or not. Um, this is the moment of shock, of transformed vision and of a profound change in the conditions of perception. And this is historically what the avant-garde at its best was supposed to do. So cliché is, I will, will argue, a certain condition that razor moments fall into <laughs> subsequently. And I'm thinking here about their comings and goings in uh, action cinema. So let me start there and give you, first of all, some very broad indications of what I understand by action cinema and why I find it interesting. I'm interested in transmedia that action genres, that is action material that crosses between media as well as between different cultures and national and local formations of the film industry. I'm interested in action genres as they organise popular stories of locality, community or nation building and also translocal or international encounters. 
I, I care about how continuity and change are negotiated in local cultural formations that are subject to transnational media influences. This aspect, the aspect of the production of continuity, is often neglected in theories that are shaped by very strong rhetorics of break and rupture, razor moment theories, if you like. But continuity is a key interest for me. How on earth do we produce it between shocks, across shocks, in spite of shocks, and in between shocks, and yet produce it, um, we do, both in popular memory and in historiography and certainly in cultural production. I've argued in uh, a lot of earlier work that action cinema is a useful case for, for study if you're asking yourself these sorts of questions. First of all, action cinema has very well developed aesthetic and industrial traditions across a variety <coughs> of cinemas. Its transnational makeup and appeal are not new, and the genre has already gone through several cycles of popularity since the early Euro-American cinema uh, of attractions and the importance of action in, in those foundational moments. Action, though, in the past 40 years now, has been one of the world's most widely consumed forms of entertainment. And while the Hollywood version has largely shaped uh, English language critical interest in the genre, or rather in the generic field, I think it's just too big to call it a genre. Um, action films are made in Hong Kong, Korea, Thailand, and more recently, in terms of international take-up, India increasingly uh, dominate the multimedia scene. But second, action dramatizes the conflict-ridden conditions of its own circulation and globally popular status. Action films are blatantly concerned with cross-cultural and geopolitical conflict, with civilizational clashes, and having absorbed both elements of science fiction and the historical period adventure. They're concerned with culture shocks of time travel to other societies or with an anthropological force to your own society in another phase of its development. And um, in Singapore, a couple of years ago, I, I had the amazing opportunity to watch Tamil blockbusters pretty much non-stop on the Tamil channel. And in some of the films I saw, the uh, time travel to the other society was on the overground and the anthropological travel to your own society early on was in the underground of the film. So, I mean, this is quite a widely dispersed uh, template um, for widely diverging uses. Action is thus a type of historical fiction and when it's successful, it rarely recognises the otherness and diversity of the past. Telling stories of local, national or global heroes saving their world, whether it's large or small, from annihilation, action films fictively resolve the conflicts and uncertainties of their own time, and they deal with burdens of history in sometimes a frighteningly immediate way. I mean, the cliche example there is uh, True Lies, James Cameron's True Lies in 1994, which circulated scandalously at the time of its release as a Gulf War comedy. But uh, as one of cinema's most globally exposed scenarios of a plane smacking into a high-rise tower, it's now a haunted prefiguration of the events of 9-11 in New York. Hollywood blockbusters were fictionally across the terrain that was once occupied in the Western historical tradition by political narratives, sometimes very exciting ones, of great men and great events, absorbed with conflict and war. But most Hollywood blockbusters conform surprisingly closely to the description of the historical novel given by George Lukács 
uh, in his early book, to the extent that they genuine, generally feature not the heroes of history, but the middling men, or even the little men, history's sidekicks. Uh, and True Lies, again, is quite a good example of that. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a computer salesman. He doesn't, he doesn't actually run any of the large entities that are in conflict. Third, action films often share an interest in the legacy of real social, political, and economic policies as they affect ordinary lives. Exploring the uh, bonds of family, um, kinship, and affinity, these are texts that um, are set usually in outposts and hinterlands of government. And they pushed beyond, in the Hollywood version, a, the public-private divide that traditionally, in Hollywood terms, corresponds to an action melodrama uh, divide. <coughs> action films are usually set in the aftermath or in the midst of the breakdown of government in periods of disorder and anarchy, as the Hollywood Western once was, and the wuxia stories of Chinese cinemas continue to be set today. They explore also the consequences of very specific, abusive or stupid acts of tyranny, sometimes as these are lived through on a family level. And shortly I'll discuss briefly a recent Korean disaster film, The Flu, uh, which does that. Finally, <clears throat> action films circulate a sense of the transnational forces shaping parochial stories. These are forces <coughs> of empire, race, kinship and migration, patriarchy, but also, very plainly put, of capitalism and struggles internal to capitalism. In the West, if you want to see popular films, that talk explicitly about crises of primary industry, manufacturing and energy production, commodity production and circulation, and now uh, of environmental emergency. Check out an action film. That's where this, this discussion most vividly takes place. <coughs> In an interracial context, Action cinema allows us then to reflect historically on industrial as well as aesthetic imaginings which do not solely derive from the West and which flow, as it were, towards and through Western cinemas now as well as around the region itself. Within this very broad field, which can include forms of all sorts of scales and styles, <clears throat> and levels of all kinds of quality, how then can you have a parochial blockbuster? Isn't that a contradiction in terms? Yes, I think it is, but it, it can become an achieved contradiction. Something industrially impossible is sometimes achieved by filmmakers. It's not the first time I've discovered when trying to think about a problem that Madhav Prasad has said something much better, very simply, than 20 years ago. Um, and in reading to prepare to come here, I was looking back at Ravi's collection in 2000 on making meaning in Indian cinema. And <clears throat> Madhav Prasad has an essay there uh, on early 1990s Hindi cinema, where he writes about, at that time, the emergence of films that, quote, provide a glimpse into a process of transformation that, instead of coming in with alternative modes, works on and appropriates the existing modes, bidding to replace the dominant rather than to rest a space beside it. And he continues with a form of a wonderful segmental analysis, which is not the sort of thing I do. Um, but that gives me a good way in to suggesting that what I'm thinking of uh, years later is a form that I'm calling parochial blockbuster that more modestly is seeking 
from various national and local filmmaking contexts to rest a space inside the dominant which is now transnationally circulating, a, a dominant vocabulary rather than a dominant industry. So they're seeking to rest a space inside a dominant form in which they work parasitically. And I'll show you some examples shortly. But as a last preparatory remark, I do need to pause uh, to specify my terms just a little. The term blockbuster, as I'm sure many of you know, um, originates, unfortunately, in World War II to describe a bomb that was capable of destroying a whole city block. But the term blockbuster was soon taken up theatrically to describe a hit, but a particular type of successful, very successful film, a uh, play initially, or a cultural event that had a huge public impact. It's used to describe successes in Hollywood cinema that were spectacular in every sense, including financial scale, visual style, and production complexity, really locks in with Steven Spielberg's film Jaws in 1975, which is a film that launched the ancillary products uh, mode of production, one that merchandises films as just the initiation of a profit chain and where most of the money ultimately comes from t-shirts, ice cream, DVD, the computer games, uh, toys, this sort of thing. And uh, one obvious reason why most people who have a passionate investment in cinema do not praise blockbusters is that very quickly this crushed and squeezed and indeed blew up uh, the opportunity or the space for a much more diverse kind of filmmaking. Um, I've heard it argued very persuasively that one of the most tragic and dangerous things in the world is that since the advent of the blockbuster, Americans no longer have a national cinema. Um, <laughs> you know, because the, the low budget and medium budget films that nourish debate and a sense of complexity about widely across one's own society are vaporised by the blockbuster economy, and I'm certainly not here to defend that. But nevertheless, um, today we use the term blockbuster in a fairly flexible sense. If it generally still indicates a high budget production aimed at a mass and very often a global market, once you move away from the Hollywood-centric account of film industry that I've been drawing on, the relationship between style and aesthetics on the one hand, financing on the other, and popular community emotional and political investment on a third hand, if I can have one, all that becomes quite volatile. The contexts of debate in which people borrow the term uh, blockbuster uh, are utterly different. For example, I would not you know, dare to even speculate about what the term means across different language cinemas in uh, India. I asked Ashish uh, Rajat Yaskar what he would recommend as a parochial blockbuster for me, and he said, Games of Wasipur. <laughs> so I have now got a copy, but mostly for me, I think I have not yet seen it. Um, but I will. A second broadly shared sense of blockbuster is a, a grand scale for the expectations of what are sometimes quite small or you know, modestly sized cinemas. The most expensive film ever made in Taiwan, which I'll talk very briefly about too, uh, might be incredibly cheap from the perspective of another country. So scale becomes relative. What starts to matter more is the public impact uh, of the themes. Thirdly, 
We can talk about blockbusters in the sense that they appropriate certain features of the Hollywood model. For example, the star-studded cast. Cecil B. DeMille in Hollywood is really the, the father of the blockbuster. But in Hollywood now, star-studded casts tend to be a kind of low-end thing. It's what you do with ageing action stars. You put them all in one movie. Um, but this Korean film, The Flu, um, borrows that along with a whole stack of you know, visual uh, tricks and cues. But the local works there, primarily I think at a figural, dramatic and formal level, that you need to have some knowledge of the local conditions of vision in order even to see. The audience for a parochial blockbuster, if it gets outside its own market, will no one is opening their eye. They won't see it. They'll just see Hollywood effect and like it or not like it. You can also have such a thing as a failed block, a failed blockbuster. It might be, <clears throat> you know, not so much uh, the scale of its profit, but it has negative public impact. Uh, and yet might be regarded as very special critically. And from Hong Kong, Peter Chan's film Xia um, fits that category, I think. But parochial, I'm just understanding pertaining to the parish. That's the original sense of the term in uh, Christian social organisation. I argued uh, some years ago in an article called On the Future of Parochialism, and this is an article that looks at a late 1980s to mid-90s Hong Kong gangster series, Young and Dangerous. Um, I worked on Young and Dangerous 4, which was set in Tun Mun, where I lived uh, for many years. I'll never finish if I start going into that in any detail, but basically um, I think that the uh, terms to which something like cosmopolitanism is either tacitly or explicitly opposed and very poorly thought about and very weakly distinguished in a lot of uh, Western English language criticism, certainly. I want to make the distinction in the Australian context between insularity, Australia is an island, and parochialism. I, I see insularity as a grounding, an epistemological condition, which, because of its sensitivity to borders, to what's off-island, metaphorically or literally, unfortunately, in the case of my country, insularity is the pole that tends to attract intolerance, vicious xenophobia, and a kind of proud, aggressive ignorance. Parochialism is much more like a form of historical backsliding on the emotional level. <laughs> Truly parochial people are actually not viciously xenophobic because they have no concept of an outside world. <laughs> And there's a self-absorption in parochialism, which is actually very damaging. I mean, if you've taught a lot of undergraduates, as I have, you, you fear for the parochial souls whose involvement in their community you love, but you know that their, their future lives economically are likely to be nasty, British and short. So here I'm using the term parochial to describe certain kinds of blockbuster forms which are leg legible across different local contexts, differently legible, but that lend themselves in this legibility or Hollywood effect to the elaboration of parish pump or local matters to an extent or to a degree that no casual outsider could voluntarily tolerate if they could see it, if they could understand it. And I've written a very long article on uh, this film, Australia, drawing out all of its parochial issues um, 
and Ravi tells me I've inspired him to see it. But I can't guarantee that you'll see any of the things that are, you know, in the article. Now, for all that I've said, action films generally get a bad rap from progressive critics in their own parish. Look, Baz Luhrmann's recent film um, was no exception. My slide here shows how reductively a large swathe of white critics saw the film as pitting a noble savage cliché on the left with a reactionary model of white male heroism on the right. The expatriate feminist Jane, uh, Jermaine Greer argued this when she panned the film mercilessly from the UK. But in contrast, Australia's leading Aboriginal uh, scholar activist, Marcia Langton, absolutely loved the film, and I can say more about why if you're interested later. But readings like Greer's, I think, rehearsing pieties about politically good and bad representation simplify and freeze the dynamic work of cinema. As Felicity Collins points out, um, on the role of a national screen culture, in the digital age, the circulation of audiovisual text today is multi-platform, crossing between public screens, televisions, and theatres, personal computers, and handheld devices, and is thus indefinite in its temporal as well as spatial unfolding. And it's this indefiniteness I'm interested in. When a film is made, you don't know how long it's going to keep circulating. We're much more aware that we don't know where it's going to end up, given the internet, or all the, how many places it will end up. But it's the time it can keep circulating that is suddenly rendered indefinite um, by digitalization and by handheld devices. And this indefinite production of meaning is one of the things I understand by this massively overworked preposition, trans. In some conditions, a film that's framed in the media as a national event, as Australia certainly was, may organise cinematic spaces of what Collins calls affective engagement and ethical response to socio-political issues by re-screening images of violence and suffering that have their impact dulled by daily media normalisation on TV and viral images on the internet. If that's the case, and we look back to Peter Berger's classic article about the relationship between modernism and the avant-garde, then something very important has shifted. If you remember, Berger's argument was that the avant-garde makes the breakthroughs, does the work of transformation and enablement. Modernism comes in as the domestication that uh, takes the avant-garde gesture and turns it into a tea towel decoration. Following Collins, and I suspect he's right, now that wherever there is a bombardment, a dulling saturation of news and images uh, of dreadful events, it's actually the organisation of the slower space of the mainstream blockbuster that is the one that is likely to produce a razor moment to take the sort of dullness of, as you do in Australia, bad news stories about Aboriginal people day after day after day, what actually cuts that is a highly controversial and extraordinarily ambiguous national film like this. How does that sense of eventfulness arise? Well, I mean, the ordinary industrial storytelling is one of the, the main ways in which a sense of eventfulness is initiated. But that storytelling, which includes pre and post uh, production mm -hmm. stories about the star's doings, 
All of this is extended then by online fan pages and YouTube parodies, and this helps to stabilise common sense fields of reference that moderate what matters about a film for public purposes in any given place and time. Like all common sense, these fields of reference are plural and shifting, but they're bound up <laughs> with wider <laughs> negotiated social worlds, and they produce often temporary but real interpretive communities of strangers interacting across time. Now, this image circulated widely through social networks in Australia a couple of years ago, picking up on the moral authority and the iconographic force of this great Indigenous Australian actor, Gopalal, to build communities of consensus about Australia's once shameful but now literally murderous hostility to immigrants who seek to arrive as refugees on our shores, as the ancestors of 98% of Australians have done since 1988. <coughs> come in with the mention of communities of consensus. I've, I don't like slides with quotes, but this one's a little difficult, so I'll put it up. Kara Keeling, a um, very important African-American scholar, draws on Bergson and Deleuze to argue that a cliché is a type of common sense that enables motor movement to occur. She extends Deleuze's account of cliché, which is pretty bleak, um, by drawing on Gramsci for a much warmer understanding of common sense as a shared set of motor contrivances that affect subjective perception and a collective set of memory images. The term common for healing relates to a community at large. Now, I'm going to show you a very rare image of sensory motor movement produced by cliché. Almost everybody's felt this, but you very rarely see a picture of it. This is two people, one of them is me, right, watching Baz Luhrmann's Australia, and a friend of mine, Sally McEnany, who is a, a very accomplished art photographer, unbeknownst to any of us, sneaked this huge camera into the theatre and took pictures of us watching the film. And I love this image because it's a, it's a cliche of gendered response to melodrama. <laughs> I'm going, <gasps> and my shoulders are up, and he's going, ah, what a heap of shit. <laughs> So, but we're both moving. Both of our bodies are moving through our senses and the complex of experiences and thoughts and feelings, all those things you have, are generating this movement. And I think it's time for a clip and I will show you what we're all watching. extraordinary thing. My parents would never have taken me had they known, I think. But because it was a national event, everyone was dragged along and I had an asthma attack for weeks afterwards. And this is all coming back because I'm you know, seeing this thing which, in, which is absolutely like magnificent. It's an overwhelming sort of image. Now, um, the original meaning of cliché, I'll come back to that clip in a moment, um, was a technical term for a plate 
cast from movable type to be used in printing. And in French today, to this day, it can still refer to the photographic negative from which multiple images or copies can be made. Film cliches always generate multiple responses. That's something that we ignore or don't research seriously when we just use it as a shorthand, you know, um, aesthetic boo word. Um, and interestingly, when newspapers were printed with block type, in French there would be many set phrases that would be used frequently in articles to save time. These phrases were built with block letters, but they were held in place by the cliché. So the cliché is the device that holds common materials together. And that's in you know, quite an interesting way um, to think about. Cliché, um, one of the things clichés also do is provide talking points for building critical community. And here are shots of two of the dozens of websites uh, devoted today to trashing and celebrating cliché in Korean drama that I found when I uh, searched the English internet once for an article about concepts of cliché in Korean aesthetic philosophies. I failed to find anything at all on the English internet, but what I did find was this global conversation about cultural Koreanness, ongoing between people everywhere willing to communicate in English. Some people were Korean Americans, evidently, but many, many clearly were not. Now, cliche, you look at it, doesn't signify aesthetic failure for me. I'm following Ruth Amosi's pioneering 1982 account of cliche as a reading effect that emerges through a reader's act of recognition, and that act is historically and socially specific. There's no such thing as an intrinsically cliched image. We decide whether a particular figure is threadbare, and we also change our minds. Yesterday's cliché becomes today's classic, yesterday's classic becomes today's cliché, and that process continues with the work of innovation and recall that artists do on our behalf. <coughs> Cliché is a uniquely modern concept, carrying an ambivalence about repetition that had no more place in classical Western rhetoric than it does or did or does in many artistic cultures around the world that are based on an apprenticeship relationship between a master and a disciple in some way. In classical Western rhetoric, creativity and imitation were convergent rather than opposed principles of production. You were supposed to repeat the established model. You had to find a way to say her breast was white as snow that was absolutely perfect and stunning, but it was still her breast was white as snow. Not, you know round like a rotten orange or something. It had to be a cliché. Um, and this slide gives you a very quick glimpse of uh, an excellent article on the Han Cinema website where it's claimed leading writers of Korean drama are advising on how to use clichés well in your own efforts of writing a soap opera. So. I don't have time to linger on that, I just want to suggest that it's there. But this article is funny, but it points us towards something crucial about cliché, that we don't always notice what it's doing. Anti-cliché websites are critical because they undo the passive absorption with which we meet most clichés, and they make us collectively notice what kind of work um, a particular cliché has done. Cliché for Ruth Amacy is experienced um, as alienating by many people because it's spoken by an anonymous voice. It <coughs> puts itself forward as common property, but the reader recognises and wants to disown this common property very often. And this accounts for the angry or wincing recognition that we experience physically in relation to clichés uh, 
uh, about our, not our, national, regional, local, ethnic, religious cultures uh, and gender roles. And there's a lot of wincing goes on in anti-cliché websites. But film blockbuster consumption, and this is very important, differs in material ways from the literary reading um, that Amnesty takes as a norm. Because these often financially gargantuan productions are and must be classical in their open embrace of the creative powers of repetition and imitation. Blockbusters are meticulously crafted from cliches because they are aspiring to cross linguistic, social and cultural boundaries, the law. The story has to be known, the characters have to be typical, it has to be readable from as many <coughs> incommensurable and sometimes non-communicating cultures as possible. The film grammar, the semiotic substance all have to be easily grasped and as in classical rhetoric, the pursuit of excellence, which is now research-based and primarily digital, occurs on the plane of performance and execution. So blockbusters are famed for their special effects, but a blockbuster stands or falls absolutely on the inventiveness and the delicacy of its handling of cliché. A technical masterpiece like Cameron's Avatar, whatever else you might think of it, it is a technical masterpiece, has got to stand up in a battered uh, video recorder on the side of the road at a garage in Central Australia with only five people for 3,000 miles. That's what makes a blockbuster that is really, really successful. Okay, the last part now, I want to talk about some examples. Lumens Australia belongs to a recent mode that reworks parochial materials or affect that are nationally significant. Korean cinema now makes many such films and they're very often controversial because they arouse the sensation of being alienated precisely by clichés affirmed as common property. Cliché is a popular term for embarrassing heritage material. And it's important to ask embarrassing for whom and, and why? Conversely, though, it's important to ask what happens when large popular audiences anywhere actually fail to recognise cultural memories that filmmakers would like us to have. And this happens increasingly with the increasingly sort of mixed up um, fund of references that the internet brings to people who are able to, to access it. This failure to recognise brings serious dilemmas. Um, Paul Willeman pointed out in the late 80s that the capital intensive nation, the nature of film production induces a forced internationalism in film industries as it wedges filmmakers between a multinational mode of address, as in the blockbuster, and the homogenising project of any state which is willing to subsidise state, local or national cinema. But state subsidy is a fading option in many countries now under neoliberal governance. And featured filmmakers aspiring to create a critical but popular cinema that transforms the canonical stories of a local past, thereby face intensified difficulty. Willeman looked to film festivals and to the work of schools, film schools, um, to produce you know, something different, but increasingly that's very, very hard to achieve. And even if you do, there's no guarantee now that a revised story, iconographic tradition or soundscape will have a correlate um, for much of the desired audience. And if that fails, the artist's carefully critical act is ignored or lost. And here's an example uh, from Australia. Now that clip I showed you, I did some research on this, 
And out of 414 popular reviews on the Internet Movie Database, overwhelmingly, the Australians, along with everyone else from around the world, assumed that that scene was a remake of something out of the Hollywood film Out of Africa in 1986. But in fact, um, it was a you know, very carefully calculated revision of a once famous scene from a film called The Overlanders, uh, made by Healing Studios in 1946. And of course, I don't have time to go into the detail, but you see you know, the type of difference uh, being made by substituting a mixed heritage Aboriginal child for the white drover who was the central controller of vision in the early uh, film. Vision matters there because the white drover says and repeats in the later film that the only thing cattle fear more than a man on horseback is the man standing on his own two feet looking them in the eye. Uh, and the little boy has to test this on the edge of the cliff but he has also the support of his grandfather's uh, magic singing, which he's using at the same time. Now this is not a uniquely Australian problem. Um, and one of its sort of the joys of this kind of random uptake of things, uh, I'll give you an example, I don't know if you can read it, but this is the cover of a VCD I found in Hong Kong, of Baz Luhrmann's first film, Strictly Ballroom, which is described as the story of two people fighting their artistic freedom against a repressive regime. You know, if any of you have seen this film, it's about a ballroom dancing class in a very small <laughs> country town. And somehow or other, Robert De Niro has got to become the director. I mean, it's just, yeah, wonderful. But the style of composition that goes into parochial blockbusters, and I think Zhang Yimou's hero, which is a good Hong Kong, a good Hong Konger, I hate this film, um, but the composition is made through layering a multiplicity of possible media memories that a variety of audiences could have. I look at this, I see, yes, I see all the Orientalist stuff, I, you know, I understand um, about his use of Chinese landscape conventions in other scenes, but I also see Ben-Hur, and I see, above all, Mad Max, uh, the sort of, the, the design of that is extraordinarily um, thick in, in its aesthetic reference. So, just moving along a bit here. Okay, three examples, uh, and then I can end. How much longer have I got, Ravi? Um, I think we spent 15 minutes a week. Yeah, that should be good. Okay. Um, where are we? Okay, how we make traditions, how cliches become canonical. I've talked about how we produce cliches in an act of recognition, but there's also, as I've just mentioned, movement back the other way. The power of cliches to ask a very unsettling question of every audience member, which is, do you recognise me? Do you remember me? When we laugh or hoot or wince or catcall or boo in the theatre, the answer we're giving is yes. But at the same time, this way is opened, this very dense multinational way, this path, is opened for refusal, negation, indifference, misrecognition, and aberrant acts of creativity. Let me sketch three ways in which Clee says shape involvement as they migrate through time. First, they make and remake cultural canons that respond to social change. Consider the mutilated hero here, the one-armed swordsman, of the East Asian film tradition. Filmmakers and audiences alike 
entire of this story. But then, as the context shifts, remember and reinvent it. I don't have time to go into detail about the cliche of the mutilated hero, and I hope some of you recognise and remember at least some version of it from somewhere. I'll simply say that I think the power of this particular border crossing time travelling figure today is to pose the question of creativity's relationship to the constraints of cultural heritage or the canon. The one armed swordsman, uh, I think, you know, the blind swordsman, the one legged, whatever, is widely read by many critics as a central post colonial figure. I mean, for fairly obvious reasons. The mutilated hero who has partial access to tradition is missing something and then needs to improvise new ways to generate that, some kind of wholeness and new existence. But this story, even in Zhang Shou's day, which was 1967, this sort of classic came out, always pitted the canonical law of the father, which in uh, wuxia cinema is the law of revenge, repetition, every crime against the family must be revenged again and again and again and again. It pitted that against the mother's desire for letting go of the past and the mother's desire for innovation, desire for peace, desire for change. Mapping those two laws, the law of revenge and the way of innovation, onto two figures, the warrior, a man here, and the farmer in the original film is a woman. The farmer wants the warrior to just forget about what happened, cure his wounded arm and stay and be happy. Now in Choi Hart's 1995 version, two years before Hong Kong's return to China, the one-armed swordsman resolves this conflict by first eating and consuming, literally, then throwing away the torn book of tradition, only to invent his own way uh, to return to the warrior's path of revenge. And I, I have a clip of that, but I, I don't think I have time to show it. I highly recommend it. It is uh, Choi Hark's The Blade from 1995. It's one of the great swordplay films of all time. Yeah? Oh, I'd love to. But you have to give me an extra four minutes. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid the subtitles are French. The peaceful woman farmer has become uh, an orphan. Everybody here is just devastated by attacks from bandits and evil people. The entire society is shredded. And she's just screaming at the one-armed swordsman. Why do you want to do this? You'll just get killed. You're absolutely crazy. And he doesn't say anything, but you can see what happens. He's been practicing, and he cannot find his center of gravity to become a great swordsman again. But in this scene, he does.
said to have involved 36 cameras. The final fight here, the blade is absolutely stunning. Um, but there, I mean, you, you do see, a, I think it's a, a razor moment of Chinese cinema, but you you see that, whoops, what am I doing? I said to Ravi earlier that giving a talk makes you terribly <coughs> stupid. Okay. Um, so after that uh, film, which, which in its difficulty and complexity was actually not very popular, nobody made this story for a long time until in 2011, Peter Chan Ho Sun made Wu Xia, which is also a wonderful, wonderful film, and it ought to put an end to the story of the one-armed swordsman. In his version, the warrior turned farmer hero actually at the beginning of the film is we're back in the peaceful world of the of Changsha's version. And in this one, the warrior cuts off his own arm at the end of the film in order to refuse the law of the father. His father is a evil sort of murderous uh, figure who wants his son to come back into the family business of so rapping, pillage, torture and <laughs> general extortion. Um, the hero has run away and when he realises that his father has come, and I'm sure you will appreciate that in uh, Confucian inflected society, this is an extraordinary moment. He refuses his father and so that he can't be asked to be a warrior, he cuts off his own arm in order to remain a farmer with the women. Um, and the doubling back to the 1967 moment, and this is the parochial investment in the sword play blockbuster, Wong Yu, who was the hero of the 1967 one-armed swordsman, returns as the wicked father in uh, Chan's 2011 version of this story. But this film failed. It pushed beyond what people who are audiences for sword play and wish our films were willing to take. And it failed in Hong Kong because people didn't want that type of you know, resolution. So, very sadly, I, I don't know if this is going to be true, but I read an interview with Peter Chan when he said, well, now I'm going back to my pragmatic, rational response to filmmaking, and I'm going to make bourgeois comedies set in Shanghai. <laughs> Um, here are two uh, Chinese examples. On the right, after shock by the so-called Steven Spielberg of the People's Republic, Feng Shagang, has all the framing, the visual sublime, but just a little of the visceral CGI effects of a Hollywood earthquake disaster movie. But it turns out, in fact, to be a full-on Chinese family melodrama. And while we could and should have a long discussion about its politics in relation to the realities of earthquake management in China, which are pretty bad, um, the unusual thing is actually the rave reviews it gets in popular internet sites in the West for being rich in meaningful human values as compared with Hollywood fare. But on the other hand, Benny Chan's Hong Kong film City Under Siege appropriated the then globally popular form of mutant superhero saga, throwing in the Western circus theme that featured in and ruined the last couple of um, series of the TV show Heroes, and throws in some flying daggers for good measure. But the Hong Kong genre of comedy that it revives is so local and so hardcore Cantonese in its totally zany comic mayhem that Western critics and viewers had no idea what to make of it. It's got the unhinged feeling you get from old black and white Cantonese films, if you've ever seen one, that paint the effects directly on the screen. And I loved it, but that's another story. Mm. A seriously magnificent film is this one, um, Warriors of the Rainbow, or Sidi Bali from Taiwan. 
It's a film about the 1930 uh, Wisha incident in which Taiwanese Aboriginal people of the Sidic Bada tribe rose up against Japanese colonialism. They massacred Japanese, including women and children, uh, and this in turn was followed by catastrophic Japanese reprisals which came close to gen genocide in their impact. It's an epic history film. And in 2011, it was the most expensive Taiwan film ever made. It had a film festival circulation. Its world premiere was at the 68th Venice Film <coughs> Festival, shown in Toronto and so on. But what this director did was divide it. This is quite a common solution in Taiwan. The film is four and a half hours long because it starts in 1875. And for international consumption, which emphasises the story rather than the historical detail. Um, it's two and a half hours long, so they actually drop two hours out of it. But you can get the Chinese DVD, which has the lot on two discs, and it's absolutely worth it. It's an extraordinary film, but again, it, it shaped controversies, and it's the controversies that form the thick medium of circulation that I think makes these films so important in countries where it's not easy anymore to make cinema. One controversy obviously came from um, Taiwanese Aboriginal people who uh, criticised the accuracy of various representations. It was very unpopular in the PRC. I think um, mainland China has become very clever at reading films about Jap Japanese colonialism, which are actually films about them, um, <laughs> including all the recent Yip Man films made in Hong Kong, where Yip Man escapes Japanese invasion, but everybody knows he ran away in 1949 from the Communist Party. Um, Cross-strait tensions inform all of the debate in Taiwan about this film, and very widely, including in Taiwan was a sense of amazement that there was a rich Aboriginal historical story to be told. So if films could be made more often, this could be just the beginning. There's a clip of the US trailer which is just awful. I can't bear to show it. <laughs> because what it does in order to promote it um, is cut very fast so that it looks like an exotic version of The Last of the Mohicans, Braveheart or Dances with Wolves. The whole difference when you see this film is duration. In this film the duration of the shot is long, the duration of the scene is long, the duration of historical unfolding of events um, is lengthy. So, And I think my last example, I can show you with a couple of images, the parochial and the global. Mm -hmm. It's a Korean disaster film made in 2013. <laughs> if you like to show clips, you can. Hmm? If you like to show clips, you can show clips. If you want to. Okay, time's getting away. Yeah, uh, you do that extra five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> It's up to you. It's up to you. Let me. Yeah, you decide. I, don't, I actually didn't want to show it. Right. No, I didn't want to show that one. But I will take your invitation to show uh, another one here. Um, this, this film I have a parochial bond with, not because I'm Korean, but it begins with the big one, the killer flu which uh, someone who's lived in Hong Kong for 13 years and lived through SARS, which for six terrifying weeks we thought might be the big one. Uh, it begins with some illegal immigrants who are transported in a disgustingly crowded container truck from Vietnam through Hong Kong. Uh, the flu is in the container where it mutates very fast, kills all of them except one, and when the container lands in Seoul, that person goes out into the crowd. Now, they were originally going to set the ensuing um, urban disaster film on a remote island, but they decided instead to set it in Bundang, which is a highly affluent suburb of Seoul. Uh, and I think it's a, maybe it's a kind of response to Gangnam style. 
But if I will show you the Hollywood trailer here, just to make Ravi happy. But I then want to talk about why this much less grotesquely um, cuts out the uh, specifically Korean dimensions of it. Z. Uh, 
I suppose I should say. There's the family, and there's, there's people running around, but they're not densely packed. Not that the use of space there around the human figures is quite different. They swarm, they're all like the zombies in World War Z are all sort of swarming down there. There are many, many images of swarming, most of them sort of associated with Arabs in this film. Um, but in Korea, when the crowd gathers, uh, I mean, this is, this is a still where they stand and look at what appears to be a coming catastrophe. And there's this accusatory gaze straight at the camera. I mean, it's a very, very different aesthetic under uh, all of the appropriated features of the disaster film. So I'm going to end with a little postscript about an entirely different mode of production, which I also love. Really, really, really cheap films, which parody, live parasitically, off various kinds of blockbusters. Um, one of them is this very zany uh, modern Buddhist poem film made in 1990. It shows you two lower middle class Hong Kongers who are just desperate to make some money. So they decide to cross the border and try a new career as smugglers. And they, uh, on the soundtrack, they speak very bad Mandarin which is, I like to, this is probably a fantasy, but is rendered in bad English in the subtitle. <laughs> uh, and the kind of cultural shock that they get. So they're small potatoes trying to be gangsters, but not doing a very good job. The second clip is both quite short. Um, it takes me back to Australia and where I began. It's uh, from a collective called Short Black Films. I don't know if you have the expression here, but in Australia, Short Black is an espresso coffee. Um, but it's an initiative of the Redfern Waterloo Community Safety Plan in Sydney, which gives young Indigenous actors in the local community the opportunity to make their own short films. And they go straight up on YouTube. Short Black Films has its own um, YouTube uh, channel. In this, just in case you can't quite understand uh, the accents, two Aboriginal boys try to hold up a corner store. When the owner refuses them cigarettes because they don't look 18, one of them indignantly shows his ID to prove that he's old enough to smoke. So, and the title of this film is Dim Crims. Without the wider cinema, none of this comedy would make any sense, even though these two films are not in any way connected. Sorry, I cannot do that. What are you talking about? You do not look 18 to me. You're a jerk. Just hand them up. 
Australian humour, uh, which, yeah. So thank you for your patience. 